So, Father in heaven, thank you for letting us be here. This is a beautiful building that you've given us and wonderful friends, Father, and, and your word that is just so amazing. We confess to you, Lord, that we fall short of your glory every single day and that we want to uh, improve, Lord God, our fellowship with you and our relationship with you and with each other. Lord, we ask that uh, you'll bless this study. We ask that you'll help us in this country, Father, that you'll pour out your Holy Spirit on the face of this earth and that you'll draw all people to you. Lord God, we ask that, Father, in this country, you would help our president and his uh, staff and all of the leaders throughout the country, whether they be Democrat, Republican, or whatever, Lord, convict us all in our hearts, Lord, to follow your will, your divine establishment principles, Lord. We pray that you will help our servicemen and women, Lord, that they might have fellowship wherever they're at, and that, Father, you would please um, just have mercy on your Christian people that are around the world, especially those who are suffering, Lord, and poor, hungry, living in countries where they cannot worship you openly, or living in and through some type of disaster. Father, we would ask that you would please bring an end to this COVID nonsense, Lord, and that that would um, be something, a, a, a memory of the past. Father, we do want to pray, Lord, for all those that don't know you. And Lord, we just ask for a special dispensation from your gospel and a conviction of sin that you would bring to them, Lord. Bring to all of us, Father. Lord God, we pray for our church, for all the churches around the world that are speaking your truth by means of your spirit. The Father, you'd bless them and help them convict the pastors and teachers to study and bring your word accurately, Lord. And Lord God, please just increase your presence here on the face of this earth. You've, you've told us where sin abounds, grace abounds more. We'll give you the praise, we'll give you the glory in Jesus' name. Please bless this study. Amen. All right, my friends, we are in Exodus chapter 12, and we'll do just a little quick review and go from there. So where we're at is this. The Lord is going to prove to the Israelites and to the Egyptians that all false gods are false gods, okay? That they have no power, that they have no sway over people. And so in doing this in Egypt, where he has made it a point of taking things to the nth degree, okay? He's actually, in a way, hardened Pharaoh's heart to prove his points, we're now at the point where the death of the firstborn has happened, and that's the Passover. The reason, of course, it's called the Passover is because the angel of death passed over the believers, the children of Israel, or anyone who had the blood on the doorposts. And you wonder, you know, you really wonder how many Egyptians after seeing all these plagues and stuff, went into the houses of the Israelites and said, I, I want to be with you guys. There's, there had to be some converts. So, because when we see um, Israel, the Jews leave Egypt, they're gonna, there's going to be about 2 million people total. 600,000, and I'll get to the exact figure in a minute. Um, in fact, the exact figure, if you, since you ask, is 603,550 men. And you ask, where did he get that? Well, Exodus 38, 26 tells us that. Numbers 146 tells us that. So don't tell me the Bible isn't specific because it's pretty specific right down to the last guy. So now what we're doing is in chapter 12, we're going to see this plague of the firstborn break out, the, the death. And it's going to be the firstborn of not only 
the people, the children, but it's also going to be the firstborn of the animals. And do you remember back when we studied uh, about the birth of Moses, that the Pharaoh then ordered all the boys of a, prior to a certain age to be thrown into the Nile. And later on in history, as Jesus was born, another Pharaoh will order the death of baby boys. So was this retribution? Yeah, in a way it was. You know, what, what does God say? Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. I will repay. And this is how the non-believers, the Egyptians, treated the Israelites. And uh, this is what goes around comes around in this case. So in chapter 12, verse 1, it says, The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in Egypt, This month is to be for you the first month, the first month of your year. Tell the whole community of Israel that on the tenth day of this month, each man is to take a lamb. Now, so the Jewish calendar used to start around mid-September. Passover is mid-March. So now a new Jewish calendar would start in what our calendar would say mid-March. Okay, It would start with the Passover. The Passover is, is first on the Jewish calendar. Now remember another thing too is that, you know, Moses has not received the law yet, but we're going to see things that are associated with the Sabbath, etc. here. So he says, tell the whole community of Israel that on the 10th day of this month, each man is to take a lamb for his family, one for each household. If any household is too small for a whole lamb, they must share one with their nearest neighbor having taken into account the number of people there are. Now this is going to be a picture of Christ's death, this lamb. So think about that as we're reading this. You are to determine the amount of lamb needed in accordance with what each person will eat. The animals you choose must be year old males without defect, and you may take them from the sheep or the goats. Take care of them until the 14th day of the month. That's four days. When all the people of the community of Israel must slaughter them at twilight. Now it's interesting because in 11.4 it says, So Moses says, this is what the Lord says about midnight. I will go throughout Egypt. Every firstborn son in Egypt will die from the firstborn son of Pharaoh who sits on the throne to the firstborn son of Pharaoh of the slave girl who is at the hand mill and all the firstborn of the cattle as well. There will be loud wailing throughout Egypt, worse than there has ever been or ever will be again. But among Israelites, not a dog will bark at any man or animal. Then you will know that the Lord makes a distinction between Egypt and Israel. So while there's darkness in the land of Egypt, that's the, that's the ninth plague, okay? Darkness so thick that you can't even see your hand in it, in front of your face. At midnight, God is going to send the angel of death, and he's going to strike the firstborn of Egypt. At twilight, the Israelites are to take this lamb. Now, let's see what it says. It says... In verse 6, 12, 6, take care of them until the 14th day of the month. So for four days, from the 10th to the 14th, the households were going to treat these lambs like they were pets and become acquainted with them. And so this will be a lesson to the children especially that um, they have to be willing to sacrifice. And God was willing to sacrifice his first begotten, his only begotten son. Now, an interesting thing is four days before the death of Jesus Christ, Jesus rode into Jerusalem on a donkey and spent four days in Jerusalem getting acquainted with the people there. It was a picture here of what would happen in the future. Okay. 
the the point of this would yeah the point of this was that the sacrifice would hurt you know the sacrifice would be very meaningful this lamb lamb had become a part of the family and so to sacrifice a part of your family is like that's that sacrifice will stick in your mind and yes rose Exactly. Yeah. Isn't that something? Okay. So, it says in verse 6, Take care of them until the 14th day of the month when all the people of the community of Israel must slaughter them at twilight. Then they are to take some of the blood and put it on the sides and tops of the door frames of the houses where they eat the lambs. There's none on the threshold because the blood of God, the blood of Jesus Christ is not to be trampled on. That same night, they are to eat the meat roasted over the fire. The fire represents judgment, along with bitter herbs. Bitter herbs um, signifies the, the, the oppression that they had in Egypt for those hundreds of years, and it also signified the sorrow for sin. So they're to... That same night, they're to eat the meat roasted over the fire. That speaks of judgment, along with bitter herbs, which speaks of sorrow, and bread made without yeast. Yeast in the Old Testament, as well as the New Testament, always typified sin. Okay? So yeast uh, was not to be uh, even in their house. We'll see that in just a minute. Do not eat the meat raw. Many of the pagans in this time ate meat raw and so uh, he says don't eat the meat raw or cooked in water but roast it over the fire head legs and inner parts do not leave any of it till morning if some is left till morning you must burn it this is how you are to eat it this is usually how i eat my food with your cloak tucked into your belt your sandals on your feet your staff in your hand eat it in haste it is the Lord's Passover. <laughs> I'm ready to go back to work once I have my sandwich or whatever, you know. Uh, and, and the reason that he said this is because they were to be ready at a moment's notice to leave. And indeed, it was pretty much a moment's notice. Pharaoh told them to leave. He almost demanded that they leave. And not only did he demand that they leave, but the Egyptians gave them gold and silver because they had um, respect for Moses and they had respect for Moses' God as well as, it, in a way it was kind of reparations for the, the years of slavery that uh, the Jews had uh, experienced in Egypt. So God even gave, gave them a little paycheck. Now, it says here, What's that? No, I don't see where it was demanded of at all. Um, in fact, it says in chapter 11, verse 1, Now the Lord had said to Moses, I will bring one more plague on Pharaoh and on Egypt. After that, he will let you go from here. And when he does, he will drive you out completely. Tell the people that men and women are alike to ask their neighbors for articles of silver and gold. So they asked their neighbors. So we are in verse 11, chapter 12. This is how you are to eat it, with your cloak tucked into your belt, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. Eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. On that same night, I will pass through Egypt and strike down every firstborn, both men and animals. And I will bring judgment on all the gods of Egypt. That was the Lord's first. Um, let, let me let me put it this way: the Lord's first priority was to get his people out of Egypt. But in so doing, he was to show the Egyptians as well as the Jews, because you got to remember. The Jews had been there for a hundred years, so they were Egyptianized in some way. Uh, they had pro there's probably Jews that worshipped 
some of those Egyptian gods, etc. And so he was going to show the Jews and the Egyptians that those gods had no power. Now, it says, And I will bring judgment on all the gods of Egypt. I am the Lord. The blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. No destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. What does that tell you about us? If you've got the blood of Jesus Christ covering your heart, God passes over us in judgment and in condemnation. You know, it says in Romans chapter 5, verse 1, there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Listen, guys, there's no condemnation because we have the blood of Jesus Christ on our doorposts, all right, in our heart. And what a big deal that is. You know, you, you, you hear of Christians all the time talking about um, how, you know, God is going to punish them for sins and, and all this stuff, you know. And, and they're, they're, they're very, many are very legalistic. But the fact of the matter is this, is that Jesus Christ has paid for our sins. Now, that doesn't mean we get to go out and sin. What it does mean is we have a respect and a gratitude to God for doing that, okay, for, for freeing us. He took the Israelites out of Egypt. Egypt represented the world. Do not love the world or the things in the world, for the love of the Father is not in the world, right? Yeah, do not be conformed to the world, it says in, in uh, Romans chapter 12. So, we have here that the Lord is going to pass over the Israelites and anyone that's in this house with the blood on the, the doorposts. Verse 14, this is a day you are to commemorate for the generations to come. You shall celebrate it as a festival to the Lord, a lasting ordinance. And it's interesting because, you know, Jesus, when right before he died, he told his disciples, he says, remember me, okay, by getting together and sharing communion. And the, the bread represents the body of Christ and the blood and the cup represents the blood of Christ. So in the same way that the Passover was to be remembered and celebrated, all right, and celebrated, Jesus asks us to remember his life and his death and the fact that he passed, that judgment passed over us. Yes. Right. Well, okay, so the, the comment is, is that, like, for example, the coronavirus, you know, the Lord takes care of his people. So, you know, all, all I can say is there's a balance there. Okay, there's a balance there. You can say, a new, newly married couple can say, hey, if God wants us to have children, we'll have children. Right? Well, God loves the children and if you don't take precautions for having children you're going to have children so there's a balance there as far as God my faith knows that God takes care of me but I'm also not going to tempt God either by you know going out into say somewhere that is uh, uh, dangerous or whatever without proper precautions does that make sense? You know, uh, I have faith that God is going to bless me and deliver me, but I also 
He also gave me a mind that says common sense. And so, you know, yes. Well, you know, and, and I, have, I have friends, Christian friends, that believe that God will heal them from diseases or whatever, whatever, whatever happens, right? Um, God can do anything he wants, right? But if I break my foot, I'm probably going to go to a doctor to have a set. I'm not just going to sit around and say, well, God can put my foot back together. That doesn't make sense. God gave us doctors... God gave us engineers. God gave us these people with these bright minds so that he could use them in their fields. I wouldn't, would you, would you go to a doctor that said, oh yeah, yeah, I, I learned my, uh, my uh, doctoring skills on YouTube. <laughs> or an engineer that said, ah, you know that bridge, yeah. I, I practiced with some of those uh, Lego things and it worked with Legos, I think it'll work with the other thing, you know, no. Somebody had a hand up. Yes? Is there a reason we don't celebrate Passover? There are some Christian churches that do celebrate Passover. Um, they are like messianic type churches. You know, um, the Old Testament rituals, feast days, laws, etc., are something for us to know because they are all types of something. The Old Testament is Jesus Christ concealed. The New Testament is Jesus Christ revealed. So as we look at the Old Testament, we don't necessarily celebrate those things that uh, you know the Jews did. But we look at them, we learn of them, because each one of those feasts represents something that is pertinent to our lives. So, you know, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't think... Well, well, as you said uh, previously, the Lord's Supper was instituted. Right, yeah, yeah. True. Well, and you, and you look at baptism, for example, um, John's baptism. There are seven baptisms in the Bible. Okay. John's baptism was a baptism for repentance. Uh, the baptism that we do, the water baptism, is rep a representation. It's a ritual of spirit baptism. Okay, so um, I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't probably hold it against somebody that wanted to commemorate a, a feast day or something, as long as they don't make it a law. Okay. But isn't that for the Jews too, not the Gentiles? Well, that's right. Well, it is for the Jews. Yeah. You're, dealing, you're dealing with different dispensations. Exactly. Yeah, we're, we're, we're in what is known as the church age, yeah. which is a distinct dispensation from the age of law. Correct. Yeah, and, and, and what's that? Well, you don't pick and choose what you follow. I mean, you follow... Well, yeah, like, well, if you, want to, if you want to talk about circumcision there, circumcision was a sign to the Jews of the covenant that God made with Abraham. We don't have that covenant with God. That was a Jewish covenant, so we don't, you know, we don't have to be circumcised to be a part of God's family. It was required there because it was a sign. Does that make sense to anybody? Whew. Okay. Many mess messianic Jews do. They are, still Jews. Yeah, and, and yes, Bill? Communion is basically an, a, a, a New Testament revealing of, of an Old Testament. Yeah. You guys are all getting A pluses today. Wow. You're good. Okay. okay, you guys ready? 
No, not Masons. Messianic, yeah. And they have the that they have if you want to come into it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And for a Jew, you know, for a Messianic Jew to commemorate their history and remember, you know, what God gave to their forefathers, I think that that's more acceptable than for a Gentile to do it because a Gentile wasn't involved in really those things. All right, let's go on. Now, verse 14, I'm in 12:14. For this is a day you are to commemorate for the generations to come. You shall celebrate it as a festival to the Lord, a lasting ordinance. For seven days you are to eat bread made without yeast. On the first day, remove the yeast from your houses. For whoever eats anything with yeast in it from the first day through the seventh must be cut off from Israel. Remember, yeast represents sin. On the first day, hold a, sec a sacred assembly and another one on the seventh day. Do no work at all on these days except to prepare food for everyone to eat. That, that is all you may do. Verse 17, celebrate the Feast of Unleavened Bread. So the Feast of Unleavened Bread and the Feast of Passover really went right together, okay? Because it was on this very day that I brought your divisions out of Egypt. Celebrate this day as a lasting ordinance for the generations to come. In the first month, you are to eat bread made without yeast from the evening of the 14th day until the evening of the 21st day. For seven days, no yeast is to be found in your houses. And whoever eats anything with yeast in it must be cut off from the community of Israel, whether he is an alien or native born. Eat nothing made with yeast. Wherever you live, you must eat unleavened bread. Now, as we think about this, of course, in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, you might want to turn there. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, let's look at that real quick, because that talks about yeast and leaven and all that kind of stuff. Um, 1 Corinthians 5, and I'll, I'm going to start in verse 1. It's been a while since we've been in this book. It says in chapter, this is 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1. It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you and of a kind that does not occur even among pagans. A man has his father's wife. So this would be his stepmother. Okay. A man has his father's wife and you are proud. They were very tolerant apparently. Shouldn't you rather have been filled with grief and put and have put out of your fellowship the man who did this. Even though I am not physically present, I am with you in spirit, and I have already passed judgment on the one who did this, just as if I were present. When you were assembled in the name of our Lord Jesus, and I am with you in spirit, and the power of our Lord Jesus is present, hand this man over to Satan, so that the sinful nature may be destroyed, and his spirit saved on the day of the Lord. So this would be the sin unto death, okay? There's two sins in the Bible that you want to make sure you differentiate. The sin unto death and the unpardonable sin. They're different. The unpardonable sin is unforgivable, and it's a sin that only an unbeliever can commit. And what that sin is, is that is a rejection of the prodding of the Holy Spirit to accept the salvation that God has offered through Jesus Christ our Lord, all right? The sin unto death is a sin that can happen to a Christian. And what it is, I'm just going to be kind of blunt, is when a Christian is so reversionistic that he becomes no good 
in the economy of God on the face of this earth, God can take them out. Okay? God has two choices. Let the person revel in his ungodliness or God takes him out. In this case, what happened here is that this Christian man was having sex with his father's wife, his stepmother. And Paul says, I can't believe you guys are tolerant of this. You should pray and ask the Lord to hand this man over to Satan. That's, that's pretty bad, isn't it? So that his sinful nature, what is the sinful nature in us? Our flesh. Okay, our flesh. So that his sinful nature may be destroyed and his spirit, what's the spirit? Well, the soul and the spirit is the immaterial part of the Christian person, right? So that his spirit is saved on the day of the Lord. Now, uh, that was no charge on that, by the way, okay? <laughs> Verse 6, your boasting is not good. Don't you know that a little yeast, a little sin in other words, works through the whole batch of dough? Get rid of the old yeast, the old sins, that you may be a new batch without yeast as you really are. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Therefore, let us keep the festival, not with the old yeast, the yeast of malice and wickedness, but with bread without yeast, the bread of sincerity and truth. Look at John chapter 6 with me, if you would. Okay, you can turn to John chapter 6. And we're going to study some stuff in there. John chapter 6, and I will be starting in verse... Hmm. I'm going to be starting in verse 26. Jesus answered, okay, John chapter 6, verse 26. Jesus answered, I tell you the truth, you are not looking for me. Not because you saw miraculous signs, but because you ate the loaves you had your fill. So he just got finished feeding the 5,000. And they were following, yes. Uh, oh, so does mine. Huh. I'll be. Okay, let me rephrase. Thank you. Let me rephrase that, okay? Oh, my gosh. So the people were following Jesus. They followed him to the other side of the lake, right? In verse 26, Jesus answered, I tell you the truth. You are looking for me, not because you saw miraculous signs, but because you ate the loaves and you had to fill. In other words, they're looking for a free meal. He says in verse 27, do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. On him, that would be the Son of Man, God the Father has placed his seal of approval. Then they ask him, what must we do to do the works God requires? Now for all of those Christians who think that they can get saved by works, we need to look at Jesus' answer. Here's what he says. Jesus answered, verse 29, the work of God is this to believe in the one he has sent. That's the work of God. So they ask him, what miraculous sign then will you give that we may see it and believe you? He just fed 5,000 people with just a few little pieces of bread and they're asking him, what miraculous sign I had to repent twice on the way to church today. Busy highway, okay? Left-hand turn lane. Car in the lane that goes straight. Decided, he's the first one in line, decided he wanted to make a left-hand turn. And he wasn't in the left-hand turn lane. And I was in a hurry because I was hungry. So he waited and caused us all to wait all the way, and finally when the last card in the left-hand turn lane went 
He went too. Hi. I don't know why I told you that, but I had to. But that's the same thing as what we got here, right? What kind of miracle can you show us? Duh. Um, he says, what will you do? Our fathers ate the manna, I'm in verse 31, in the desert, as it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth, it is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. We're going to see in our chapter in Exodus here coming up about the bread, the manna. Sir, they said, from now on give us this bread. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never go hungry, and who believes in me will never be thirsty. But as I told you, you have seen me and still do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never drive away. For I have come down from heaven not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I shall lose none of all that he has given me. That's pretty inclusive, isn't it? I shall lose none of all. What percentage is that? Yeah. Yeah. He's not going to lose anybody. That's eternal security. If people talk about Christians losing their faith, they need to go back to the parable of the seeds and the soils. They, they need to go back to so many scriptures. How about the ones that says, no one can pluck them out of my hand. And then he, he, he backs that up with, no one can pluck that out, them out of my father's hand. So then you've got Christians who say, well, you know, if you sin bad enough, you can lose your salvation. Oh, really? You can pluck yourself out of the Father's hand. You're powerful. Woo! -wee. I will never leave you or forsake you. That's right. Now, where are we? Somebody help me here. 41. Okay, thank you. At this, the Jews be... Oh, wait a minute. Let me see. I'm going to start in verse 39. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I shall lose none of all that he has given me, but raise them up at the last day. For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. At this, the Jews began to grumble about him, because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They said, is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How can he say I came down from heaven? Stop grumbling among yourselves, Jesus answered. No one can come to me unless the father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last, at that last day. It is written in the prophets, they will all be taught by God. Everyone who listens to the father and learns from him comes to me. No one has seen the Father except the one who is from God. Only he has seen the Father. I tell you the truth. He who believes has everlasting life. I am the bread of life. Your forefathers ate manna in the desert, yet they died. But here is the bread that comes down from heaven, which a man may eat and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Then the Jews began to argue sharply among themselves, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? This was very controversial here, my friends, in Jesus' day. Jesus, is, Jesus and his followers were, were um, accused of being cannibalistic. Yeah. He goes on in verse 53, he says, Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is real food, and my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in him. 
Just as the living Father sent me and I live because of the Father, so the one who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Your fathers, your forefathers ate manna and died, but he who feeds on this bread will live forever. And it's interesting in verse 60, it says, on hearing it, many of his disciples said, this is a hard teaching, who can accept it? And it was a hard teaching. I mean, and, and, and Jesus was not being literal here, of course. He's being figurative uh, when, he, when he talked about that. But they, they took it as being literal. Back to Exodus chapter 12, verse 21. Okay, Exodus 12, 21. I can't believe we've only got finished with half a chapter. Then Moses summoned all the elders of Israel and said to them, Go at once and select your animals for your families and slaughter the Passover lamb. Take a bunch of hyssop, dip it into the blood in the basin, and put some of the blood on the top and on both sides of the doorframe. Not one of you shall go out the door of his house until morning. When the Lord goes through the land to strike down the Egyptians, he will see the blood on the top and sides of the doorframe and will not permit the destroyer to enter your houses and strike you down. Of course, in the New Testament, the destroyer is called Satan. Obey these instructions as a lasting ordinance for you and your descendants when you enter the land that the Lord will give you as he promised. Observe this ceremony. And when your children ask you, what does this ceremony mean to you? Then tell them, it is the Passover, sacrifice to the Lord who passed over the houses of the Israelites in Egypt and spared our homes when he struck down the Egyptians. Then the people bowed down and worshiped. The Israelites did just what the Lord commanded Moses and Aaron. So good advice here that Moses gives to them is teach your children about the ways of God and teach your children about the history so that uh, they will know where they came from. Now, in our country today, we've got people that are trying to eliminate the history that we have, uh, you know, that we're built on. And, you know, what a slap in the face that is to servicemen and women of all ages that gave their lives in, uh, you know, for the freedom of this country. Okay, so we are in verse 29. At midnight, the Lord struck down all the firstborn in Egypt from the firstborn of Pharaoh who sat on the throne to the firstborn of the prisoner who was in the dungeon and the firstborn of the livestock as well. Pharaoh and all his officials and all the Egyptians got up during the night and there was loud wailing in Egypt for there was not a house without someone dead. So this is a final straw for Pharaoh. During the night, Pharaoh summoned Moses. Remember when Pharaoh said, you will never see my face again? Well, during the night, Pharaoh summoned Moses and Aaron and said, up, leave my people, you and the Israelites, go worship the Lord as you've requested. Take your flocks and herds as you have said and go and also bless me. Now, Pharaoh is still under the impression that they're going to go for a three-day journey, okay? Which is one of the reasons why he sends his chariots to go get them, because he realizes, huh, that's a long three-day journey. And he realizes that they're gone forever. So that's when his heart is hardened again, and he sends his army to go get what he considers to be his slaves. Now... So we are in verse 33. The Egyptians urged the people to hurry and leave the country, for otherwise they said, we will all die. So God has made his point. So the people took their dough before, so there wasn't even enough time to bake the bread. They took the dough without the yeast and took off and carried on their shoulders and kneading troughs wrapped in clothing. The Israelites did as Moses instructed and asked the Egyptians for articles of silver and gold and for clothing. The Lord had made the Egyptians 
favorably disposed toward the people and they gave them what they asked for so they plundered the Egyptians. The Israelites, verse 37, journeyed from Ramesses to Succoth. There were about 600,000 men on foot besides women and children. Well, that's a lot of people. We're talking, we're definitely talking well over a million people here. You think about that, a million people leaving Egypt. And all their animals. Uh, talk about an exodus. This was an exodus. Yeah. Now, so, verse 38. Many other people went up with them. So these would be Egyptians, handmaidens, servants. Well, they probably didn't have any servants, but uh, probably people that had decided that, hey, Man, I ain't staying an Egyptian if God's mad at Egypt. I'm going with these guys here. All right. Now, many other people went up with them as well as large droves of livestock, both flocks and herds. With the dough they had brought from Egypt, they baked bread, cakes of unleavened bread. The dough was without yeast because they had been driven out of Egypt and did not have time to prepare food for themselves. Now, the length of time the Israelite people lived in Egypt was 430 years. At the end of the 430 years, to the very day, all the Lord's divisions left, left Egypt. Because the Lord kept vigil that night to bring them out of Egypt, on this night, all the Israelites are to keep vigil to honor the Lord for the generations to come. Now we see in verse 43, the end of chapter 12, Passover restrictions. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron, these are the regulations for the Passover. No foreigner is to eat of it. Any slave you have brought may eat of it after you have circumcised him, but a temporary resident and a hired worker may not eat of it. It must be eaten inside one house and none of the meat outside the house. Do not break any of the bones. The whole community of Israel must celebrate it. And when we look at um, John 19, 33 and 36, we see that none of the bones of Jesus was broken. Okay. So, yeah, which was also a fulfillment of Psalm 34, 20. Psalm 34, 20. Let's just take a look. At it. Well, let me just look at that. I'm going to see if Lee gets an A plus today. Right. Okay. It says, um, a righteous man, in verse 19, may have many troubles, but the Lord delivers him from them all. He protects all his bones. Not one of them will be broken. Yeah, that is a prophecy concerning the Lord, huh? Okay, A+. plus. Mm -hmm. Try. All right. Verse 48. An alien. See, you didn't know that the Bible talks about aliens, did you? An alien living among you who wants to celebrate the Lord's Passover must have all the males in his household circumcised. Then he may take part like one born in the land. Remember, circumcision was a sign. It was the sign of the covenant. So when an outsider, okay, a non-Jew, wanted to become a part of the Israelite community, then he had to submit to the ordinance of circumcision because that was the sign of the covenant, okay? Yes? <laughs> no, we're not aliens. Aliens here means just foreigners, just, just non-Jews. We're foreigners, that's true, we're non-Jews, that's true. So we're aliens. Oh, Lord, help me. All right, here we go. It says... No, let me see, an alien living among you, I'm sorry I said that, who wants to celebrate the Lord's Passover must have all the males in his household circumcised. Then he may take part like one born in the land. No uncircumcised male may eat it. The same law applies to the native born and to the alien living among you. All the Israelites did just what the Lord commanded. Moses and Aaron commanded Moses and Aaron. 
And on that very day, the Lord brought the Israelites out of Egypt by their divisions. Let's go into uh, chapter 13. So in memory of the release that the, that the Jews had from Egypt, they are told to consecrate their firstborn to the Lord. Remember something about the firstborn in many cultures is they were considered to be the most valuable. Okay, the firstborns. The Lord said to Moses, Consecrate to me every firstborn male. The first offspring of every womb among the Israelites belongs to me, whether man or animal. Then Moses said to the people, Commemorate this day, the day you came out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery, because the Lord brought you out of it with a mighty hand. Eat nothing containing yeast. Today in the month of Abib, you are, t you are leaving. When the Lord brings you into the land of the Canaanites, you notice he doesn't say if, it's when. The Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Hivites, and Jebusites, the land he swore to your forefathers to give you, a land flowing with milk and honey, you are to observe this ceremony in this month. For seven days eat bread made without yeast, and on the seventh day hold a festival to the Lord. Eat unleavened bread during those seven days. Nothing with yeast in it is to be seen. You're not even to look at it among you. Nor shall any yeast be seen anywhere within your borders. On that day, tell your son, I do this because of what the Lord did for me when I came out of Egypt. Boy, isn't that a fact we're supposed to tell our kids about our testimony, you know? This observance will be for you like a sign on your hand and a reminder on your forehead that the law of the Lord is to be on your lips. For the Lord brought you out of Egypt with his mighty hand. You must keep this ordinance at the appointed time year after year. You know, it's interesting that many Orthodox Jews have a what they call a phylactery and it's a little it's a little leather container that they either wear on their forehand or on the wrist that contains a, you know a part of the law or the law and you know they, they still didn't get it you know the law is to be written on your heart but they just they put it in a little box on their head you know and and here they're walking around which is amazing it just tells you just tells you how stupid people are okay Jesus Christ is there as an adult, as the Savior of the world, preaching to them in person. And they've got this box with the law on it, and they don't recognize the Savior of the world. That's, that's pretty crazy. Now, it says, um, For the Lord brought you out of Egypt with his mighty hand. You must keep this ordinance at the appointed time year after year. Verse 11, after the Lord brings you into the land of the Canaanites and gives it to you as he promised on oath to you and to your forefathers, you are to give over to the Lord the first offspring of every womb. All the firstborn males of your livestock belong to the Lord. Redeem with a lamb every firstborn donkey. A donkey was considered an unclean animal, so you were to redeem the, the donkey with a clean animal. Okay? Um, re redeem with a lamb every firstborn donkey but if you do not redeem it break its neck yeah redeem every firstborn among your sons in days to come when your sons or when your son asks you what does this mean say to him with a mighty hand the Lord brought us out of Egypt out of the land of slavery when Pharaoh stubbornly refused to let us go the Lord killed every firstborn in Egypt, both man and animal. This is why I sacrificed to the Lord the first male offspring of every womb and redeem each of my firstborn sons. And it will be like a sign on your hand and a symbol on your forehead that the Lord brought us out of Egypt with his mighty hand. So now we're going to see a problem. The problem, the first problem that the Jews encounter in the desert is too much water. Then they're in, going to encounter not enough water. Okay? So let's look at the first one here in verse 17. 
When the Pharaoh let them go, God did not lead them on the road through the Philistine country, though that was shorter. It tells us why. For God said, if they face war, they might change their minds and return to Egypt. So God leads them away from these warring peoples that would come against the Jews. So God led the people around by the desert toward the Red Sea. By the way, if you look in your concordance, this word red in the Hebrew means reed. R-E-E-D, Reed Sea. I, I know that's weird. Uh, and when I first heard that on the History Channel or somewhere, I thought, well, you people are wrong. Ungodly people. But it does mean Reed Sea. And if you look at, if, if I'm going to try to do this backwards, okay? So if Egypt is kind of up here, then the Mediterranean Sea would be up here, Okay. Uh, Israel, let me see, Israel would be, I'm looking at this backwards, over here, okay, the, the Red Sea has two fingers that come up like this, and then there's lakes and stuff up there. So the historians have no idea where the Jews crossed the Reed Sea, okay, um, we just know that it was a miraculous crossing. Oh, do they have they figured it out? Oh, that's awesome. Is it in one of those reed lakes? Awesome. Okay. All right. So, so God led the people around by the desert toward the Red Sea. The Israelites went up out of Egypt, armed for battle. Now, did they have? Different versions have different ways of looking at this. Um, I'm not sure that they were armed. I'm, I'm not sure that they had weapons. Maybe they fashioned them after they left. I don't know. Moses took the bones of Joseph with him because Joseph had made the sons of Israel swear an oath. He had said, God will surely come to your aid, and then you must... So uh, when Joseph was alive and dying... He told his, his people, you know, God's going to be with you. When I die, don't leave me in Egypt. Take, take me to the promised land too. God will surely come to your aid, and then you must carry my bones up with you from leaving this place. After leaving Succoth, they, they camped at Etham at the edge of the desert. By day, the Lord went ahead of them in a pillar of cloud to guide them on their way and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light so that they could travel by day or night. Neither the pillar of cloud by day nor the pillar of fire by night left its place in front of the people. So we will pick up in chapter 14 um, next time because I'm getting tired of talking. Uh, sorry, <laughs> I'm running out of breath. Uh, besides that, you're probably getting tired of listening to me. Um, so we'll pick up in chapter 14 and 15 and 16, which is very interesting because we're going to see that the Jews come. God actually takes them and leads them to this place where they have this body of water ahead of them and then Pharaoh's chariots show up in the rear and they're trapped between a rock and a hard place and uh, you know God puts us in impossible situations to prove that he's the one that delivers us out of impossible situations